I had a pleasure in Barcelona being with the team in, at the Lower Alliance and there's some amazing things going on. So we're gonna learn a little bit more right now for the next couple minutes. Awesome. Thank you. So yeah, I'm Hardy Schmidbauer and today I'm uh, speaking on behalf uh, of the Lower Alliance. So I think this is a quite uh, common chart now. This is not uh, a new chart. Everybody has made the prediction that, that IoT will reach you know, billions of devices by, by 2020. But I think the interesting discussion of this chart is, is not the, the, the volume of it, but what technology is going to make up the, the growth in IoT. I think who doesn't matter who you speak to now, it's fairly uh, consistent between analysts and, and different telcos that low power wide area networks will make up a, a major portion uh, of the growth of IoT devices. So the, the Lower Alliance is standardizing low power wide area networks uh, for IoT. Uh, LoRa stands for, for long range. So the, the main benefits of, of LoRa are long range, low power, low cost connectivity. Uh, LoRa is the physical layer technology and LoRa One is the, the protocol being standardized uh, by the Lower Alliance. I think if you look at the, the key to new technology adoption, you know, standardization and ecosystem are the two things that really lead to mass adoption uh, of new technology, and that's what the, the Lower Alliance is providing for low power wide area networks. Some of the key features of, of Lora um, and, and Lora One is, is security. You know, the, the Lora One uh, protocol was really architected from the ground up. Uh, to, to have uh, device security and network security. Uh, security is something you can't add on at the end. It has to be architected from the beginning. Um, and LoRa One was definitely architected uh, from the beginning uh, for security. Uh, LoRa has very long uh, reach coverage or, or long network coverage with the technology, uh, but also built into the protocol is adaptive data rate and full bi-directional communication. So it makes a, a very scalable bi-directional protocol that can serve you know, a variety of different applications and a variety of different application verticals. Uh, LoRa is al also architected you know, from the ground up for energy efficiency and, and long battery lifetime. If you compare it to cellular, you know, cellular is really architected for spectrum uh, optimization at the cost of battery lifetime. LoRa is the complete opposite. It's really optimized for, for battery lifetime at the cost of a spectrum utilization, but for the most uh, case, most of the LoRa networks are being deployed in the unlicensed bands, so it's not a big concern about the, the spectrum utilization. There's also a number of uh, unique features uh, around LoRa about using it for uh, location. Uh, so I think one of the, the key verticals of IoT and LP1 is the low cost asset tracking market and LoRa has a, a very clear roadmap to enabling you know, very low asset tracking on, on a very large scale. So in the uh, alliance, um, I'll talk about the, the membership on the next slide, but there have been a, a number of nationwide public uh, IoT low power wide area networks using uh, LoRa One. Kind of the initial traction of, of LoRa was really with the, the European telcos, and then spread, you know, I think through most of the, the different the major uh, Asian telcos, and now we're seeing a lot of momentum in, in North America uh, with uh, public networks being announced by Comcast and by Senate, which I'll talk about shortly. Uh, you don't have to utilize LoRa One in a, in a public network uh, type of uh, deployment model. I'll talk about deployment models on the, on the last slide. But you can use these for, for private networks or for regional networks or even citywide networks um, as well. In the LoRa Alliance, the alliance was started uh, just over two years ago. Um, in that two year period, we're already over 450 uh, members, a very healthy um, ecosystem. Uh, from major technology companies such as IBM, Cisco, Samsung, uh, Orange, Comcast, to you know, small startups who want to create products and, and services for IoT. So we have that ecosystem uh, that all see the, the value and the benefit of the standardization of, of low power wide area networks. So I think one of the, the key things to the success of, of LoRa and, and LoRa One and, and low power wide area networks in general is the strength of the ecosystem. I think in, in the LoRa ecosystem has a, a very strong ecosystem with multiple uh, uh, providers in each segment of the, of the ecosystem. So from a, a chip standpoint, you can get uh, LoRa based chips from multiple different semiconductors. You can get 
uh, modules from, from multiple different module companies, same for the gateways, the base stations, and the, and the core network. So you can stand up an, an enterprise IoT network for your specific vertical for, say, a, a metering application. If the vendors you choose to create that solution uh, you don't like or, or they go away or have a different focus, there are multiple other providers that can step in and, and be the solutions provider for that. So I think you know, the health of the ecosystem makes uh, Laura One really the, the no-risk choice for low-power wide area networks and for IoT deployments. So one of the, the key things to standardization is, is obviously certification and test houses. So set up now worldwide our, our test houses with a, a lot of the major uh, test houses with TUV, seven layers, AT4. There's also a number of, of smaller uh, regional EU um, test houses. Um, and there's a, a very large portfolio now of, of modules and sensors and devices uh, which are LoRaWAN certified. And the, the main benefit of, of being LoRaWAN certified is that if you're, uh, you're designed to go in the Comcast network, you can also already directly plug into the Senate network or uh, easily modify to be uh, deployed or utilized in a, a network in South America. So Senate is one of the companies who is uh, deploying uh, LoRaWAN network here in North America. So you can see they have quite a bit of, of network coverage today. So the, the green bubbles are here are, are their, their network coverage across the, the United States. Well, they're currently in, in 23 states and cover a, a population of, of 50 million people. Um, clearly they're, they're not nationwide yet, but they're trying to expand to that. Um, and one of the things in the LoRa ecosystem that you see is there may be a public network available, but if there's not, there's lots of uh, providers who are willing to, to set up the network for your vertical or for your application, or you can also take the different components from the ecosystem and put up your own network as well. Uh, Comcast is also doing a major initiative uh, on LoRa and LoRa One. Um, they've deployed out fully uh, Philadelphia, uh, currently working on deployments in the Bay Area and Chicago. Uh, but they're also bidding on a number of other, say, IoT projects uh, with LoRa One and, and, and with Machine Q that'll expand their, their coverage. Uh, their plans are to cover uh, the 19 of the top uh, 25 DMAs over the next couple years. I think same as, as Senate, if they don't have network coverage today and you have a use case or you have a vertical, they're willing to come in and put up the, the network for that, that application. <clears throat> so now on, on deployment models of, of LoRa. I think this is one of the, the key features of, of LoRa and the ecosystem is you're not uh, mandated to utilize one model. You can utilize uh, many different deployment models. And I think with all those different deployment models, you have different monetization models. Uh, so lots of the, the European telcos, and I think Comcast and Senate, are planning to do a, a nationwide deployment with LoRa. So you can directly plug in your application um, into that uh, network and utilize their, their network coverage for, for your application. Uh, you can take the different, say, components of the LoRa One ecosystem and set up your very own private network, which is solely for your use, uh, for your application. You manage it. You, you put up the network. Um, there are lots of those type of deployments, and that's really how the initial deployments of, of LoRa happened were really uh, private networks. Uh, one of the, the key advantages of, of LoRa, which you know, we're trying to lever leverage with my new company, TrackNet, is the, the indoor uh, gateways. You can integrate LoRa into Wi-Fi routers or set-top box for a very little uh, bomb addition, um, and that's a very way, easy way to get uh, network coverage is through the sale of consumer products or, or building solutions and expand your, your network coverage. Uh, it doesn't have to be put up on a, on a tower like some of the other low power wide area networks. Huh? It uses a small internal integrated antenna. So you, it's a, really the same link budget, but you have a different antenna efficiency in, in a worse optimal location, but you still get you know, pretty broad coverage from an indoor gateway as well. Um, you can clearly put things up on, on towers. That's what a, a lot of the early adopters of, of LoRa deployed their networks with, especially in Europe. I think you will always kind of need a, a bit of a hybrid approach between outdoor and indoor. We view that as the, the optimal deployment model uh, for low power wide area networks, is being to, able to leverage both of the outdoor and the indoor to get uh, network coverage in the most scalable way and with the, the best uh, capex and opex um, of the network. 
Uh, a key thing to the alliance is also roaming. So the key topic in the technical committee now is, is really enabling uh, roaming. A number of the providers um, have already done roaming tests and announced uh, roaming agreements uh, before Mobile World Congress. So here in the U.S. where you probably have you know, two or three networks between Comcast, Senate, uh, they're already working on a, a roaming between those networks so you can expand the, the coverage of LoRa uh, through roaming. I think everybody in the LoRa Alliance ecosystem views that as a key to the success um, of LoRa. So I think al along with that come uh, different deployment models. And I think each of these different, uh, sorry, monetization models, each of these different deployment models I think have different options for, for monetization. I think the traditional model, which I think everybody thinks of first, is your, your traditional ARPU, your revenue per unit. This is extremely common in the cellular industry. Most people who originally looked at LoRa looked at it under this kind of connectivity model. You pay a subscription per month uh, for, the, for utilizing the, the network coverage. Uh, but more and more, we see other types of business models you know, being quickly adopted to, to monetize IoT and, and LP1. So the, the second one is a service. You can provide a, a complete service, um, not only providing the connectivity, but providing the complete service to the end user. Uh, there are some people in the, in the building space going into buildings saying, we will take over the operation of your building. We will save you X uh, amount per month. And they split the, the revenue uh, for that service of reducing their operational expenses um, of the, the building. So, those are some examples of, of using uh, monetization with a, a service. If you look at um, consumer and uh, other types of applications, I think the connectivity cost needs to be built into the device. So a lot of people are, are planning on providing products which have the five-year or 10-year connectivity built into the, the end device cost. Uh, so you don't have a, a reoccurring you know, revenue per unit model, but it's really built into the, the end device cost. Um, and another way I think there's, there's lots of people who are willing and want the, the data of consumers and buildings and, and other types of applications. Uh, so another way I think to monetize IoT is managing is who has access to that data based on the uh, end users or the, the data owners permissions. There are lots of people who are willing I think to, to pay uh, for access to some or, or all of that data. So that's another model. Um, that we see uh, being adopted quickly in, in, uh, in low power wide area networks. An example of that is uh, in Japan, they are deploying uh, air quality sensors across uh, Japan. Uh, they're not deploying that under a, an ARPU model, but they're really deploying that uh, to gather the data and then sell the data to hospitals and the government for where they need to improve on, on the air quality across the country. So any questions on, uh, on LoRa Alliance or on uh, deployment models or monetization uh, for uh, low power wired air networks or IoT? Yep. Can you discuss the um, location um, for LoRa, like what tec techniques they're using indoors? Sure. So there, there's a couple different options for location with, with LoRa. So the, the first one, most common one you find today is using a, a GPS in the sensor and using LoRa as the, the backhaul uh, to get that location information. Uh, one of the other unique features of the LoRa physical layer is being able to extract the, the timing um, out of the uh, transmission of the signal. So it's called a time difference of arrival. They do time stamping in the gateways. And you can triangulate a position uh, based on that without GPS. So it, it lowers your, your cost of the, of the end device, uh, a bit of a trade-off in, in accuracy. So both of those models are available today uh, with LoRa. And I think as you get a more densified network, you will get a, a bit of a hybrid between signal strength, uh, time difference of arrival, and be able to really enable really low-cost um, asset tracking. And when I say low-cost, I think, you know, the the roadmap is to achieve, you know, tags that are, are less than a dollar and, and fully disposable. So, Hardy, yep. uh, my question. I have the ability to do that, too, I guess. Uh, question on, obviously, TrackNet's doing the consumer stuff in your home, but you have never mentioned security. And with low power, long distance, all the things going on with set-top boxes and home, can you tell me a little bit about your philosophy around securing the data 
Sure. I mean, uh, security is essential, I think, for, for LP1 and, and for IoT. So LoRa already has security you know, built into the, the protocol. So there's two different layers of security. There's a network layer of security, and then there's a, a data or payload uh, level of security. And that payload data remains encrypted even through the, the network operator until it hits the, the end user's um, application server. And there's no association of a node uh, of a node to a gateway in LoRa. The, the gateways are really a pass-through. It's a, a long-range star architecture. So even though my gateway is in my home, I may be receiving your data from your kid or one of your devices. That doesn't mean that I can see that data or even access that data because that device is provisioned to you. The gateway is just a pass-through to the, the network server, and your data still only shows up um, in your application. Um, and not in mine, even though I may, you may have utilized uh, my gateway in my home. I think that's how you, know, you can build network coverage with LoRa. It's all collaborative. All the gateways tie back into, into one core network and can expand uh, the, the network. Um, you can clearly break it out to be dedicated or a private network, but I think that the shared model has a lot of benefits in general for IoT and, and low power wide area networks. Excellent. Any other last questions? Great. Hardy, thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.